Okay, here we go. That's me again. So I, just to reiterate, um, I teach earth science classes at Pierce. So that's oceanography, geology, and environmental science. But I also have found a passion for online course design. Um, when I put my own ocean oceanography class through the course design academy in 2017 to 18, and just loved it so much. And the timing worked out when we were starting a um, poker program at Pierce. So poker is pure online course review. And that's where at a campus level, we help faculty with their online course design. So I work a lot with faculty on their online course design and have become you know, pretty familiar with the tools that we can use and as well as accessibility tricks. So we will be going, to, going over today um, best practices in online course design that are based on the CVC's um, course design rubric that we use in poker. When we are reviewing someone's class for pure online course review, we use a rubric that outlines these best practices. So we will be um, including many of those in what we cover today. So the webinar outline, I'm going to share as a Google Doc. So I will put that link in the chat. So then you can pull it up if you want. So that is the Google Doc. Please let me know if you are not able to access it. But essentially that is, okay, I see lots of people going in that suggests it worked, good. So that's an outline of what we're going to cover today along with some active links to resources that I will be referencing um, throughout the webinar. So essentially, we're covering best practices in online course design with a focus on how to embed content into accessible Canvas pages. So what we mean by embed is that we want to actually bring as much content as possible into Canvas so that we're not sending students out to YouTube where they might get distracted and not come back or having them download a PDF and then upload a PDF. Instead, putting everything into Canvas using Canvas pages as a vehicle um, to present the content and to provide context. So we tell students exactly what they should be doing with that resource. So we'll cover embedding reading, including OER resources. Those are the open education resources that are available for free online. How to embed images, videos, and files. Um, providing clear instructions on how students should interact with the content. And then once you have the content on a page, we also want to make it manageable for students so that they're not presented with a wall of text that is going to make their brains shut down. If we have a bunch of text that we want students to read, we need to break up that text with appropriate headings and blank spaces between paragraphs, shortening paragraphs, using lists, either bulleted lists or numbered lists um, so that it makes the content more manageable for students. So we'll go over chunking pages with headings, adding alt text to images, and properly formatting lists and links, which is very easy in Canvas with the rich content editor, which is that editor, editing tool that we use um, for all Canvas assignments, discussions, and pages. And then we'll go over how to check your pages for accessibility using Pope Tech, which is a course level accessibility checker and the Canvas accessibility checker that is built into Canvas. That's also called the little person accessibility checker because the icon is a little person. So just some general tips, and then we'll go into Canvas and show you what this actually looks like. In general, Canvas allows you to drop content items directly into modules, like links, files, and videos. But if you drop that content directly into the module, it doesn't provide the context that students need so that they know what to do with that item. If you have a PowerPoint or a video, what should they do with the PowerPoint? Do they need to print it out? Do they need to look at it? Is it optional? The video, what should they be looking for as they watch it? Is it optional? Is it required? And that's where the Canvas pages come in 
where you can embed the video onto the page so students don't even have to click a link. The video is there for them on the page. And that just streamlines the access for students to the content. It makes it easier for them to access it and know what to do with it. For PowerPoints, um, I'll show you how to embed the link to that file in a Canvas page with instructions on what to do with it. So it's okay to use PowerPoint files. Um, I know when I was building my online class, teaching it for the first time, I basically started with the PowerPoint because that's what I would use in my in-person classes. And I wanted to provide my online students the opportunity to use the PowerPoint as like an outline of what's covered in that module. So I provide it as an optional resource and it's a file. So instead of just, again, dropping it in the module, you embed the link to the file in the Canvas page and then tell students what they should do with it. And again, I'll show you some examples on how you can do that. And just a quick note too, that, that any files that you use in your class, including PowerPoints, need to also be ADA compliant. They need to be accessible. Um, and on the outline for this webinar, you will find some links to resources to help you check your PowerPoints for accessibility and fix the accessibility. It's actually really easy in PowerPoint because they have an accessibility tool that will lead you through identifying and fixing any errors. Um, we will also go over, I know a lot of people nowadays are using those free online education resources, open education resources, I should say, OER materials. And we have a couple of different ways to bring those into Canvas. Again, instead of just providing a link out to the online textbook to students, probably they're not going to follow that link if it's too hard, right? Bring it into Canvas, either by copying and pasting it and then fixing its um, formatting, or we can use what's called an iframe, which involves a little bit of HTML um, to embed the external reading onto a page. So again, I will show you how to do that today. Okay, so now we are going to switch over and I'm gonna show you examples of what we just went over in Canvas using examples from my um, online oceanography class. So we'll look at how to embed videos and provide instructions, embedding a PowerPoint file with context, adding multimedia content to a Canvas page, and formatting for accessibility and using Canvas's accessibility checkers. Okay, so here is the outline again. Now I'm gonna take you into Canvas. Okay, can someone give me a thumbs up that you see my Canvas modules here on the screen? Perfect, thank you. All right, so here's an example of a, a class in Canvas that is organized into modules. So modules, as most of you know, are like folders that open and close. Usually we use these for different units, which usually correspond to weeks, but might also just correspond to chapters or units in your class. And then within each module, you add the content. So what I was saying with Canvas allows you to drop that content directly into the module is if you go to you know add an item, it allows you to add a file, add an external URL, add an external tool. But when you do that, the materials just are dropped directly into Canvas with no context. So here's an example of a link, right? That is dropped in, it's an external tool that is dropped directly into the module. So when I click on it, we will see that there's a video. Am I supposed to watch it? Is this important? What should I be looking for? Is it optional? Is it required? How do I turn on the captions? How long is the video? Okay, I can see how long it is, but there's no instructions, right? When you drop it right in there, students aren't going to know what to do with this video. Imagine walking into a face-to-face -face class and just starting a video without saying anything about it. Students are gonna wonder what they should be paying attention to, right? So with videos, we want to provide the same context that we would if we were going to be showing that video in class. You would introduce it, you would say, all right, 
we're going to watch this two-minute video that's going to provide an overview of this week's content. So here is that same video embedded onto a Canvas page. Okay, so let me go into edit mode so you can see what this looks like and how to do that. So in this case, this video is hosted in Canvas Studio. So to embed it onto the page, I would use the Canvas Studio icon in the Rich Content Editor, find the video that I want to embed onto the page. Let's just choose this one for fun. And then you see the option to display media tabs or display a download option. I generally do not use those, but the display media tabs is very helpful if you want to easily track which of your students have watched the video and which haven't. And in some instances, it's very helpful to know that, especially if it corresponds to instructions for an assignment and the student didn't follow the instructions. You can go back and look, well, did they watch the video? And if they didn't, then you can say, hey, be sure you watch the videos that go over the assignments because you know they didn't watch it. So I'll just select that so you can see what that looks like once we embed it. If I did not select that, it would just show the video. So here, I just have the video without the media tabs. So when you select that, you see these tabs here at the bottom, and that allows you to see details um, of the video. Insights is where you're gonna see a list of students. So all of your students who watched the video will appear there. You'll even be able to see if they jumped through it, if they skipped through it. Did they watch 6% of the video? Did they watch 90%? Did they watch the whole thing? So that can be very helpful. The important thing, so, so number one, embed the video onto the page instead of just a link out and provide instructions on what students should do with it. So please watch the video below for a brief introduction to this week's content. Watching the video will prepare you for the week and then provide instructions on how to enable full screen mode, and most importantly, how to view captions. So the instructions for captions are gonna be different. If it's a YouTube video, you would just say select CC, select the CC icon to view captions. But with Canvas Studio, you have to select the gear icon, then captions, then English. Okay. Also notice this page has a heading at the top, a heading two. That is very important for accessibility that all pages, in this case, this is actually, I use this as an announcement to introduce the content for the week. Every single item in Canvas, a page, discussion, assignment, other assignments, announcements, need a heading at the top, at least a heading two. And that helps screen readers organize the information on the page. Okay, if you are savvy with HTML, you can also switch to the HTML editor and adjust the size of the video. So just to show you what that looks like really quickly, go to the HTML editor, find the video, and then you'll see the size of the video in width and height. So this is not a webinar on HTML, but just so you know, there that option is there if you choose to use HTML. Okay, there are separate webinars on HTML, so I'm not going to get into that too much. Okay, so I'm gonna cancel that. So that's showing how to embed a video onto a page. You would do it the same way if you were doing it in an announcement. Um, okay, so let me go back to the modules. Okay, here's an example of a PowerPoint file. So once again, Canvas allows you the option to embed a file directly into the module. So if you go to file, you can add the PowerPoint, but we don't wanna do that because if we do that, notice now, okay, there's the PowerPoint, but there's no context for students. Is it optional? Should they look at it? What is it? Um, and that is where embedding the PowerPoint file the link to the file on a page 
can provide that context. So here is a simple page where in my class, um, I would embed the PowerPoint. Okay, so in this case, every module in my online classes begins with an introduction page where I outline what's covered in the module and then provide unit objectives from the course outline on record. And I use this page, right, to introduce content and to provide resources for students. In my case, these resources are optional. Yours could be required. You could say textbook information or PowerPoint slides um, or additional resources um, as the heading. And this is where you can provide the context for the PowerPoint. So if you'd like to print out the PowerPoint slides for this module, download module seven PowerPoint. The PowerPoint outlines the concepts covered in this module, you might find it helpful. And it's under optional resources, so students will know that that's optional. Um, it's also optional in my class to read the e-text. And then I also provide links to some additional reading that again is optional. So let me go into edit mode to show you how to format this page for accessibility. So notice that this is a heading two, and I begin every introduction page with the same module guidelines. Right, a module overview is a heading two. Optional resources is a heading two. Objectives is a heading two. Now notice that this is a list, right? It's a list of resources. So if it was not formatted as the list, right, it would just look like this which is okay, but it is a list. And if we properly format it as a list, it organizes the content and also makes it easier for screen readers to step through the list. So in this case, the order is not important and there's not a select number of items in the list. So that's why I made it a bulleted list. If you have you know, three tips or do these in order, you would use the numbered list tool. So just make sure if you have a list that you're using the list tool in the rich content editor to properly format it as a list. You can also accidentally make a fake list just using your keyboard. So I just did a dash, right? To visual people, that looks like a list but it's not formatted as a list. So screen readers will not know it's a list. Notice when I did that, that the accessibility checker, this is that little person accessibility checker flagged something. Let's see what they flagged. Oh, they noticed that I was making a fake list. So lists should be formatted as lists. And I can even just say, yeah, format that as a list. And then it fixed it. So that little person accessibility checker will help find some of the errors. The accessibility checkers don't catch everything. So it's still very important to look at every single item in your course for accessibility. Okay, same thing here. Okay, this is the heading three because it's a subheading. So heading two is the main heading. And if you have a subheading under that, you make it a heading three. And if you have a subheading under that, you do heading four. And then again, a bulleted list, okay? Now you might wonder, well, how do I actually embed the PowerPoint file with this text that says module seven PowerPoint, okay? So when we have links like this, we don't want to copy and paste the URL, right? HTTP colon backslash backslash. That's what screen readers will read if we put the actual URL. Right, if we put this here, right, screen readers would actually have to read all that out, which obviously we don't want. So if you want to link to something, right, you'll go to link options and then make the link text descriptive and let the person know where that link goes. So in this case, chapter eight, atmospheric circulation. So that's what we call a meaningful link. The text actually says where the link is going. With a file, 
So you would also select the text that you want to link. And in this case, the PowerPoint is considered a document. So you would either upload document if you haven't already uploaded that PowerPoint to your class. So you select upload, you choose the file from your computer, and then it will link to it. Or if you already have that um, file in your course, you would just go to course documents and then find the PowerPoint. I'll select that one for fun. Okay, and then notice that it links that text to the file. Okay, and it's most descriptive to say, well, what PowerPoint is it? It's the module seven PowerPoint. Okay. How are we doing with questions so far? Before I keep going, any questions that need my attention? There are no questions, Heather. Uh, I have a question. If I can talk. Is yes, right? please, sure. please talk. <laughs> uh, you know, I started using discussions and yet when I create a discussion, the directions for the discussion are under my assignment. But then I see that there's another, uh, you know, on the assignments page, it says discussion. Am I doing it right? I, 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 mm -hmm. I, yeah. Yes. So discussions are a type of assignment. So when you go, I'll just show you what it might look like here. So when I go to discussions, right, I only see the discussion assignments. But when I go to assignments, I see all of the assignments which are going to include a category for discussions. So that's fine. It's It doesn't mean it's repeated in the class. It's just showing you the discussions in a different way. Thank you. Heather, Heather I have another question. Yes. Um, what height width do you like to use for embedded videos? Um, yes, good question. So I played around with it quite a bit. And I've changed my approach over time as well. So I used to make them very big, but then I realized they can be small and then just encourage students to go full screen mode when they watch them. So I tend now to make them smaller and by smaller, usually I do 400 by 235 is like my standard. Um, I'll just put that in the chat, 400 by 235, which is pretty small. But again, you're going to say, you know, enable full screen mode when you watch the video. And then it just takes up less space on the page. So your page doesn't seem so long if you have multiple things on the same page. That said, it takes playing around with you. Like, that's how I settled on the 400 by 235 is um, just playing around with it. So making it 600 by 500. And, you know, some videos also have different orientations. So you also have to play around to make sure that the video isn't getting cut off. Um, because it's not wide enough. So it, it takes playing around with, but again, I just um, have settled on like a smaller video so that it takes up less space. We have a few, few more questions. questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let's see. It says, uh, for the video info about student watching, does that only work with Canvas Studio, studio videos? No, that's a good question. I. After playing around with you at Pierce, we have Yuja and Canvas Studio, and you can also do it with Yuja or any other. Like I know different schools may have different video programs and you can do this with any of them. Let me just go into this page because it has a video and I'll show you with the rich content editor. OK, so with Canvas Studio, right, there's a little icon there. If you go to um, this little plugin um icon in your rich content editor you will see that there are other options for embedding videos whether it's 3c media um you know every school might have a different films on demand um play posit soft chalk ted ed youtube you can use those tools also to embed the video onto the page yuja as well um we just want to make sure that it's being embedded onto the page so the video shows up there and not just as a link out um, with YouTube. So, so a lot of people will use this tool, this plugin tool. I don't tend to use that just because I either use Canvas Studio 
video, or if I use a YouTube video, I will just copy the embed code from YouTube instead of copying the link. And then you go to this um, three dot, which is more, it expands the menu. And this little cloud icon is the embed icon. And that's where you would paste the YouTube embed code. So that's doing the exact same thing as going to the plugin, choosing YouTube, and then finding the YouTube video. So there are multiple ways to do it with, with those different platforms. Actually, um, that was my question. And I was trying to figure out about the student results. You said you could view what students watched. Yes. That part I didn't quite understand. You cannot do that with YouTube. So that is the that is the reason why we try to avoid direct YouTube embed codes or links because then that information is going to YouTube. It's not coming to us. So if you have a YouTube video that you do not own that you want to um, use in a class, you can use this free tool called y2mate.com and that allows you to download a YouTube video onto your computer. Then you go into Canvas Studio or Yuja, upload that video file, and then embed the Canvas Studio or Yuja video onto the page. Then you can get the analytics of who watched it and who didn't through the insights. Can you do it with Camtasia? Using Camtasia? No. So. With Camtasia, I use Camtasia to record many of my videos. So what I do with Camtasia is I will export the video file as an MP4. Then I upload that video file into Canvas Studio, caption it, and then embed it onto the page as a Canvas Studio video. Because then you'll get all of that insight information that you want. And that's also an easy way to caption it. I know in Camtasia, you can caption videos. I just find it much easier to caption videos directly in Canvas Studio. Um, a few more questions, Heather. Uh, the play posit question has been answered. We can embed play posit videos. Um, uh, another question, do you recommend using percent versus pixel to accommodate users using their phone or tablets? Yes, with images. For sure. And, and I actually switched over. I changed all my images to percentages after I looked at my pages on a phone because I was using pixels and then that can be problematic on a phone. So I did switch to using, um, let me just go to a page where I can show everyone how to change the size of an image. Here's just an example of a canvas page that has images embedded and links embedded. Okay, so let me go into edit mode. So the default usually when you upload an image is for it to come in in pixels, but then it won't adjust to the size of the screen. So it's not just problematic for phones. It also is weird when you have a larger screen or a smaller screen, the image will stay the exact same size. So to make the image size responsive to the size of the screen, change it to a percentage, and then um, the image will scale according to the size of the screen. With videos, I have played around with trying to do the same thing with percentages. I think there's a video at the bottom here. I think this is a YouTube video. Um, I've tried using percentages and it would always skew the video. So it would cut it off and make it really skinny or like wide, I, I just couldn't get it right. So for videos, I do stick to keeping them small and then providing instructions on going full screen mode. Um, I just have had too much trouble with trying to get the percentage right. But in theory, it should work. But, but for me, after playing around with it, I stick to pixels for videos and percentages for images. I think that answers Audrey's question as well. Um, about, she had a question about videos and scaling. So, um, and I think those are all the questions for now, Heather. Okay, I'll check back in. Uh, how, <laughs> how did you get to edit, uh, how did you get to image options? Oh, if you just click on the, on the image. So I click on the image and it just appears. And then I go image options. This is also where you would add alt text, which we will cover anyway, but 
Um, the alt text has to be pretty short. So this is a picture of a beach, a California beach, showing tan beach sand that is dominated by quartz, um, describing the image in a few words. If the image needs more complex descriptions, you can just describe the image on the page itself. Or I'll show you another trick um, for creating a new page that you can link out to with a text description. Okay, so let me jump back out to module. Heather, one more question since it's video related and we're still sort of on videos. Um, yes. They're asking if we use Y2Mate, uh, to the tool, do we need to be concerned about the original license of the video? Of course, that is something to consider. Um, usually videos that are posted on YouTube um, publicly are available for use from anyone who wants to use them however they want. If there is a copyright on the video, um, then you would have to honor that. Um, but most copyrighted videos are not going to be um, posted publicly. And if they are, then they were probably put there um, they were probably pirated. So yes, you do want to be aware of that. But most of the videos, like the educational videos that we use, um, have the fair use um, uh, license. So if you're using it for a class to teach a concept, you're not making money on it or selling it, um, then it's usually considered okay. Okay, so let's see. Where we left off in this, so this module is just showing some examples, right, on how to embed the content into Canvas pages, keeping accessibility in mind. So we went through video, very good. We showed the PowerPoint and videos as well. So here's an example again of an animation that's just a link, right? Again, no context, what should students do with that? And we again will want to embed that onto a page. Okay. Same thing with the Canvas Studio video, we went over that. Okay, so then how do you bring all your content together? So there are lots of ways to organize content in a way that is going to help students. You could have a single page where you have all of your videos. You could have several pages where you mix in video, text, image, video, text, a mixture of multimedia on a single page. It just depends on your class, it depends on your style, and it depends how you wanna organize your class. Um, I tend, I'll just scroll down to a kind of real module where I would organize the module with these text headings. Those are nice because they, you know, visually break up the module into pieces, and then you keep that organization the same throughout your class so students know exactly where to find things. And then my content is a series of Canvas pages with a mixture of video, animation, text, images, links. Um, and that's how I organize my class. But again, that's not the only way to do it. Many instructors will just have a video page and then you know maybe some text that they use. I'll also put in a little plug here for the graded video quizzes. If you have never created a graded video quiz, you have got to do it. Students love them and they are the sure way to get your students to watch your videos, okay? So when you embed the video onto the page like we, like we um, looked at together and you go to insights and you see that two of your 35 students watched your lecture video, you might think like why what can I do? I want students to watch this. How do I get them to watch it? You get them to watch it by making it worth points. And you make it worth points by turning it into a graded video quiz. That is also a topic for a different webinar on exactly how to create graded video quizzes. Um, but it is pretty straightforward. You can do it with Canvas Studio or Yuja. And essentially, you just add questions uh, within the video that pop up when students are watching the video and then they, you know, get credit for how well they do on that video quiz. And personally, I make the video quizzes um, unlimited attempts because I want students to keep watching the videos until they get them. So that's why I put my video quizzes in the content of the course. 
But just keep in mind that that is a tool you can use if you're finding that students are not watching your videos, because it can be really disheartening when you spent all this time to create a video, caption the video, and then no one watches it. Um, so, and students love them because it helps keep them engaged to know that questions are gonna pop up. And it's also low stakes in my case, because they have unlimited attempts. They're not stressed out about getting it right. They're trying to learn the content. Um, so when you, mm -hmm. sorry, when you do that, does the, the video quizzes, you have to then, can you embed that video in a page? And then the points will go to that page, or you have to now make that attachment different. To do a graded video quiz, you actually create an assignment, and then you use external tool, and then you'll choose the Canvas Studio or use a video. So then the, it becomes a graded assignment that way. And actually, on the webinar outline Google Doc, there will be some links on how to create graded video quizzes. I think I put those there because I love them so much. Um, and if I didn't, you can search for um, how to create a graded video quiz in Canvas Studio or Yuja. Maybe I didn't put that on here. Okay. Oh yeah, here's an example. I'll just show you what a, what an assignment. So notice this resource here is a page, right? And that's the page that we looked at with the mixture of multimedia content, images, um, video, text, with appropriate alt text lists and all that. So if you create an assignment, you can use the assignment you know, instructions just as you would a Canvas page using all the same tools, Right, you want to again have appropriate headings, heading two, heading three. You can embed images, right, with alt text. Okay, and then at the bottom, you can provide instructions on what students should do with the quiz because the quiz, the the video will appear at the bottom. Once you go down here and select external tool as the submission type, then you find the video. So for me, it's a Canvas Studio video. So then you would select the video quiz and then embed that into the assignment. So I'll show you what that looks like. So here's the text of the page, providing all the background information that I want students to read first. And then the video quiz appears at the bottom. Okay. The other thing I wanted to point out on this page is notice that this pH scale, it's a complex image, right? If the alt text says pH scale and someone can't see the pH scale, they're not going to get much out of that description, right? It doesn't actually describe the pH scale. So in that case, a trick is to create a new page in Canvas that provides a text description of whatever your image is showing. And therefore it makes it accessible to everyone. Even sighted students find the text descriptions helpful when they're looking at a complex image, especially if they don't have a science background. In my case, my, my classes are science. So we have a lot of complex graphs and figures and images, and it's, it's hard to describe them in a few words. So creating a new page describing the image, right? And then notice here at the bottom, I have a link back to where the um, image is embedded because otherwise students might get lost. If they click on the link to go to the text description, then they don't know how to get back to where they were. So in this case, we just can go to a course link. And in this case, it was that graded video quiz. So I would go to assignments because it's an assignment and I would find the page where that image was embedded and link to it. Okay, I'm just gonna do one to show you. You just click on it and then it provides the link back. So that's a trick for complex images.
Okay, here's another example of a link within the course. Notice that the, the text of the link is meaningful text that tells students exactly what that link is going to take them to. It's gonna take them to a written tutorial on the carbonate buffering system. And then it's gonna take them back. So those links can be a helpful tool to help your students find their way in your course. If it's an external link, you know, a link outside of Canvas, you would just select external link when you select the link icon, and then this will take us to an outside link. And again, you wanna make sure that the text says where that link is going. Okay, checking back in to see if there are questions. There's just some discussion popping, but I don't think there's any specific questions. Okay. Or oh, there's one that just came in. Is it okay to put the image descriptions under the image instead of creating a new page? Yes. So as long as that image is described either on the page or on a separate page, you're, you're covered. Um, in my case, if I find the description of the image to not be super helpful on the page, like in this case, I could put this description of the pH scale right below the image or above the image, but I don't think it's necessary because if students can see the image, they would be able to read the pH of these various substances. So in this case, I would just see it taking up space. And I wanna try, as you can see, the pages have a lot of information, right? The way I organize my course. So I wanted to pare it down and then link out only for those who need it but you can absolutely just describe the image on the page as well. Okay, so can someone put the link to the Google Doc again in the chat for those who may have come late? Yeah, we'll take care of it, Heather. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that Google Doc again is an outline of what we're going over today with active links to many of the resources that I refer to today. Excuse me, I just had a, a question just for um, clarification in, in uh, terminologies. Uh, when you refer to the the Canvas Studio, are you talking about just the Canvas itself or is there something specific called the Canvas Studio within Canvas? Yes, it is the second thing, the latter. So Canvas Studio is integrated. It's the video platform for Canvas. Mm -hmm. and it's integrated in, into Canvas. Mm -hmm. Now that said, this is at LACCD mm -hmm. um, and I'm at Pierce. So different districts may ha have access to different Canvas resources. I think Canvas Studio is pretty standard, but I'm not 100% sure that every single campus uses it. So if you don't see a studio icon over on the left of your global navigation menu, mm -hmm. then you may not have it. But it's okay. it's just the um, the video platform that goes along with Canvas, and there are others too, like Yuja, right? Play Pause it, all those mm -hmm. different tools. I believe all California community colleges should have it. If you don't see it, you might need to contact your tech support. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I really like Canvas Studio because it makes captioning videos easy. It makes embedding the videos easy and organizing them. So I really like Canvas Studio over the other platforms, as you'll see, because I keep mentioning it. Okay. Thank okay. You. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's just jump back over to the slideshow real quick. Okay. Because so that so that's kind of an overview of how to embed content into Canvas pages, keeping accessibility in mind. I also want to show you some tricks for embedding the OER, Open Education Resources, or ZTC materials into Canvas. ZTC is just zero textbook cost. So any materials that you want students to read, right, that are posted somewhere else online. Okay, there are two, two ways that we recommend. Okay, what a lot of instructors will do, especially when they're starting or like trying out a new book, is just to provide students with the link to the e-text, right? Go read your book chapter two, but that is not bringing it into Canvas. 
and it decreases the chances that they will actually do it, right? We wanna keep them engaged in Canvas without sending them away to get distracted. So the two ways that we recommend doing this are either to copy and paste the OER content into Canvas pages. The caveat with that is when you copy something from online and then just paste it into Canvas, the formatting can get really weird. And even if it looks okay in the rich content editor, if you go into the HTML editor, you see all this crazy coding. And that provides uh, that creates a problem for screen readers. So to avoid that, if you're copying something from like a textbook PDF or an ebook, first paste it into Google Docs or Word without formatting. So you go to paste without formatting. That removes the crazy formatting. Then you copy and paste it into a Canvas page. Then you format it with headings and spaces where you want. Get rid of extra spaces. Add the images. Okay, so that's one way. I'll show, I'll show you what that looks like too, just introducing them here. And then the second way is to embed the OER content onto a Canvas page using an iframe. The iframe is some HTML, um, but you just have to copy and paste the code and then know how to use it. So even though we're not covering too much HTML today, I do want to show you that trick because it's really cool. And I think it's pretty straightforward once you learn how to do it. So I created these two pages that I'll show you um, where I show you how to create an iframe using LibreText as an example and OpenStax as an example. Um, you can find the pages that I'm going to refer to in the Canvas Commons if you search the Canvas Commons for Kokorowski, which is my last name. Um, so I am going to put my last name in the chat because I know it's a lot of K's and O's. So if you search the Canvas Commons for Kokorowski, you'll see a bunch of resources, including these embedding ZTC materials tutorials. Okay, on those pages, and again, I'm going to show you what this looks like and how to do it. But this is what the HTML code actually looks like that you would use for this method. Okay, the iframe essentially takes something that's hosted on a website and puts it into the Canvas page with a frame around it. And what that allows you to do is provide instructions at the top using the Canvas page, you know, putting text in, instructions on what students should do. Then you use this um, HTML code for the iframe, and then the reading will also appear on that page in Canvas. So as students are going through your module, the reading is right there. They don't have to go to another website, it makes it very easy and streamlined for them. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Okay, so let's go back to Canvas. Okay, so here, let's look at that iframe method first. So this page, embedding ZTC into Canvas pages, LibreText example, again, is posted on the Canvas Commons, this exact page. You would just search the commons, right, for Kokorowski, and then you'll find this page. So here's the example. This again is just the Canvas page. Let me just, I'll show you just what it looks like first. You can write directions at the top, you know, read section 3.3 below, take notes on X, Y, Z. Like, what do you want them to pay attention to? You can also provide a link to the whole book. Like you can read this reading here, or you can go to the book. And that's again, meaningful text for that link. And then see that it actually embeds the LibreText reading onto this page. Pretty cool, right? So they have the whole section here. And then you could, they would go to the next, to go to the next page in the module. Okay, so how do you actually do this? I, okay, I see a, a note in the chat that says, I thought that LibreText integrates with Canvas directly. I can embed a page or a whole book. That is true, but if you do that, it's just going to appear as a link in the module. It's not going to be embedded onto a page where you can provide instructions to students. 
So that's why we recommend this iframe method where you can pick individual sections and embed it onto a page with instructions because it's that context that students really need, okay? So the HTML code itself, right, you'll notice has this URL and that's the part of the code that you are going to replace, right? replace the link with the URL of your selection. And so in this case, right, this is a Libre text on soil science, right? So the actual URL of that page is embedded into the HTML code. So you would replace this whole section in the quotes with the URL of your selection. Keep everything else the same because that's telling it to embed it in an iframe Make it a minimum width, 100%. That means it's going to take up the whole size of the screen, regardless of the size of the screen. It's going to give it a border. See the little black line that goes around it? And that border is helpful because that tells students that something sh should be there. So if for some reason the reading does not embed properly, they will see an empty box. So it just makes it clear um, if something is missing to include that border. You don't have to do anything with this reading at all. You just copy the URL for that section, put it into the code, and then it appears on the page as is, as it is in LibreText. How did you get the iframe option though? You put it into the HTML code. So it's right here, border. So you have to actually put it in the code when you are putting it onto the page in the HTML editor. So for example, let me just, you just copy, right, that code. We go to edit. If we're gonna be putting in an HTML code, we have to go to the HTML editor, right, which is this little icon here at the bottom. Okay, and then here, let me just make myself some space. I just paste the code. So I'm telling it the minimum width is 100% and the border is one pixel solid black. If you don't put that, it's not going to put the border. So it has to be part of the code. And again, you're only going to update the source, this actual um, URL of the reading. Keep everything else the same in your code. And then see here it is right here. That's all it is. And then when you save it, which is already saved, it appears at the bottom. Okay. It's a very similar method with an OpenStax example. So same thing here, right? Here's the code. It has the same, you know, minimum width 100%, border one pixel, solid black. And again, you just copy the URL of your page, paste it in that little snippet, keep everything else the same, and then the reading appears at the bottom of the page. Okay, so that's a cool trick. If you want to use the whole section of OER reading, you don't wanna change it at all, that's the easiest way. But if you have OER reading that you wanna use, but you want to adjust it, you want to change some parts, you only wanna use certain parts, maybe you wanna use different images, then the copy paste option is probably going to be best. So here's an example of a page from an English class. It's an OER English class. And she, in this case, copy and pasted the text from the reading. So copy it and paste it, but again, you have to paste it without formatting first, otherwise it gets really crazy. So let me just show you in a Google Doc how to do that, the paste without formatting. Okay, here's, a, here's the Google Doc that is the outline of today. Um, okay. So if I were to copy text from an OER resource, and then I would go to edit, paste without formatting. That's gonna remove all of the crazy HTML formatting that are a part of that native um, website or e-reading. 
paste without formatting. But again, that will that will also remove formatting that you want, like headings and images. So it's going to remove everything, but it's going to make your life easier. So paste without formatting. Then once you've pasted it without formatting, you go to select all, copy. Then you go back to your Canvas page and paste it. Then you go back and add the formatting that you want. So you're going to add heading two. Whoops. Right, heading two. Um, I don't know if this has a heading three. Adding the images in. Yeah, here's a heading three. You'll need to reformat lists, right? Bulleted lists will need to be reformatted as bulleted lists. Um, but then your page will not have crazy HTML that is problematic. So copying and pasting again is great because then you can customize the page however you want, but you just need to be aware of the um, the formatting. Okay. So if you want to do all that on your own, again, on the outline, the Google Doc that you have, if you, it gives you instructions on... Um, finding the OER content. Where did I put that? Close captioning. Maybe I didn't put that on here. I put the HTML stuff. If you want um, an HTML cheat sheet or a beginner's guide to HTML, follow those. Um, okay, I see a message in the chat that Embedding web pages with iframes may not be accessible. So I can say that the, the HTML code that I shared with you for that iframe is accessible. Our LACCD accessibility specialist wrote it. Um, so it is a solid code to use. Okay, it, so to- I'll, to I'll just point out that it should actually have a title tag within it for to meet web aims uh, guidelines. Mm. That was my only suggestion. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a good idea. Okay. Okay, so that is the iframe method. Um, if that was new to you and you want to do that, again, so go to Canvas Commons, search Kokorowski, and you'll find those exact two pages um, on the comments. Okay, so before I go into kind of bringing it all together and more accessibility checking, any questions that I missed? I don't see any, um, but if I missed your question, do you guys mind unmuting? Because I've been trying to keep track. I think we're good. Okay, so let's then move on to accessibility. So just to go back to the PowerPoint for that. So we've gone over many of the accessibility guidelines. So appropriate headings, right, alt text for images, lists and links. Um, one thing that I did not mention that is very important is with tables, we want to avoid using tables to format text, okay? Because tables are very hard for screen readers. If you have data that you are presenting that should be in a table, you just wanna make sure that the table has um, appropriate formatting and the built-in accessibility checkers, this little person, accessibility checker will help you, you know, add a caption and a title and a heading row or a heading column to the table but don't just use a table because you think it looks great with your syllabus text. Um, that is a common uh, thing that I see many people doing. So how do you check your course for accessibility? So I've mentioned the little person accessibility checker. Um, this is just a link to a tutorial that shows you how to use it, but we'll look at it again together. And that link is on the Google doc that I shared with you. And then Pope Tech is a course level accessibility checker that is super helpful because it's easy to miss some things as you're going through your class. 
And just keep in mind too, that neither of these are perfect. Neither is going to pick up on errors um, because only you know, know your content. So heading structure, like only you are really gonna know what the appropriate heading structure should be. The accessibility checkers are only gonna check that there are headings. So you want to also make sure to check your class for accessibility. Okay. Um, there's an this accessibility checklist is on the Google Doc um, with an outline from today, as well as a link to this video tutorial series um, by Foothill College Online that is super helpful because it goes over the 10-day um, accessibility challenge. So it's basically takes all this accessibility stuff and puts it into 10 short tutorial videos. So that's a really great resource. So let's head back over to Canvas and look at those accessibility checkers. So we're gonna open a page that is gonna have some problems with accessibility. You probably see right away that this dark red highlighting behind black text does not have appropriate color contrast, right? So if we go into edit, the little person accessibility checker again is this guy down here. And if we select it, it tells us that there's a problem with the color contrast. So it's hard to fix color using the accessibility checker here. So what I would do if there's a color contrast issue is I would just change it until that error disappears. Okay, same thing here. We can hardly even see that text, right? Uh -huh. So we're gonna make that black. Okay. Now let's see, two left. Heading levels should not be skipped. Okay, so it's telling me that I have a heading two and then the next heading below it is a heading four. So with headings, we need to make sure that they are nested in order. So you always start off with a heading two at the top of the page because the title of the page is automatically gonna be heading one. And that is the only heading one on the entire page is the title. So you will never use heading one on the page and you'll see that it's not even an option. So you always want to start with heading two and then nest your headings accordingly. Okay. I got a question. Um, yeah. The headings are automatically set for 12 point for paragraph and upward. Um, now, what if you can't change those? Is that correct? They're already... <clears throat> they're, <clears throat> they're already standardized, right? You can In... change them. So they are standardized as a default. So the default for H2 um, is actually not 24 point. It's like 28.8. Um, this. So this is the default for heading two. And I recommend keeping the default size because if you keep everything the default size, it will automatically scale. And it also you can tell students if they wanna make everything bigger, they can just magnify their screen and then everything magnifies you know, accordingly so that the heading two is bigger, the heading three is a little smaller, the heading four is a little smaller. That said, you can change them. So if I were to highlight this heading two, you can just change the size using the font size here. Um, if you decide to do that, just make sure you're consistent throughout the class so that if you want your heading twos to all be 24 point font, you keep all of your heading twos 24 point font. And the same goes with bold. If you want your heading twos to be bold and 24 point font, make sure they're all bold and 24 point font. You, so can, you can also do the paragraph at 14 yep. and just yep. keep it standard. Yep. Okay. Just like that. Yep. Okay, um, let's see what else this says. Okay, alt text should not be a file name, right? That's gonna be the default. When you upload an image, the alt text is gonna usually be the file name. So in this case, to satisfy the alt text accessibility checker, if I just get rid of the .jpg, it says, yay, that's great. But the caveat there is I could say, um, this is a picture of ice cream. And it still says, oh, great, that looks good. But is that a picture of ice cream? No, and only you know that as the course creator or the visual person creating that. 
So just be aware that the accessibility checkers are just checking to see that there is alt text there that is not a file name, but only you are really gonna be able to describe your image um, so that it is actually depicting what is in that image. I mean, this one's obvious, right? That's earth, but what if it was something like this, right? I know that that's a map of earthquakes, but I could just say, you know, ice cream again, and it'll say, oh, that's great. No problems. Right, so just be, be aware that it's not gonna be able to tell if your alt text is actually describing the image. Only you can make sure that that's happening. Okay, um, on this page also, you'll see some decorative elements, okay? So on the outline, the Google Doc for today, you will see a section that is like adding flair to your pages and you'll see a few links. And one of those links is for Flat Icon. And that is a website that provides little icons that you can use as decorative elements in your class. Like this earth thing is, an, is a, um, an icon from Flat Icon. And if you use their free account, they just ask that you attribute the author of that icon on the bottom of the page. But it's a way to add cute little images. You can also use emojis. This is an emoji for a light bulb. So on that Google Doc again, you will see um, emojipedia.com and you can copy and paste decorative little um, emojis into your course as well. Okay. If you want to create like banners or other icons, you can also use um, Canva. Canva I used to create um, many of my banners. It's a free program. You can use it to create banners, icons for reading or textbook or just kind of little decorative elements. And then the other way to add a decorative element is with some HTML. You saw those lines across the page on that page, like teal lines, red lines, that's all HTML. And HTML is again, beyond the um, content for this webinar, but all campuses, many campuses, I know LACCD does, we offer regular um, webinars on um, HTML. And also on the Google Doc that I shared with you, there's a link to a webinar, a recorded webinar that I led on using HTML. So if you wanna check that out, that is a way to add some flair, just to show you real quick what the possibilities are. Here's a module introduction page that's pretty simple, right? It has appropriate headings and alt text for images. Here's a video, right? It's fine. But if you add some HTML, this is a banner, okay? The heading with the color behind it is just some simple HTML added to the heading code. This is also HTML, we call it a div container. Moving the image to the side with the text wrapping around it is HTML. Another div container. So you can see, you can make it a lot more visually appealing if you are ready to take your class to the next level with some HTML and some emojis and banners, right? So there's a lot you can do to take it beyond the basics. This webinar is uh, focused more on the basics of bringing everything into Canvas so that students don't leave and get lost and never come back. Okay. Right, so adding flair, HTML. Um, I posted an HTML cheat sheet on the Canvas Commons with some of the codes that I regularly use in my classes the lines across the page, right? Moving the um, images. Um, you can search the Canvas Commons again for my last name, Kokorowski, and it's called HTML Codes and Resources for Chunking Canvas Pages. Check out Emojipedia, Flat Icon, and Canva for other ways to add flair. Okay. Any other questions? Because I think that is what I wanted to cover. I don't know if you answered this, Heather, but um, they're asking, do the images have to be in line? In line with the text? Um, Aniko, can you um, unmute and I, I, I assume that that's what she means. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we were told that images need to be in line in the placement, not wrap for screen readers. Yes, that is using the rich content editor in Canvas. It's best to have them in line in Canvas. But the HTML code, um, I think I closed my, oh no, there it is. Um, the HTML code for moving this image over is accessible. It is okay. So if I go over to the HTML editor, this image style float right padding left. So you're basically adding padding to the image and floating it to the right. That is okay. Okay, so as long as we use uh, the HTML coding for the padding, that's okay. But if we're using the rich content editor, they need to be in line. And you know, that that is actually probably subject to interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, your campus might have a best practice or a rule against doing the image, um, you know, float left or right like this. Mm -hmm. um, but well, I, our campus, when we took the poker course, um, I asked one of the instructors because that became a topic at our campus, and they said to make sure they're in line. Okay. So then that's probably true. Well, that's why I was I was just trying to clarify because that is a topic at our campus. And I know a best practice is also if you are not going to wrap the text, you want to have everything aligned left so like this would be all the way to the left with nothing wrapped around it mm -hmm. so that is if you are using the rich content editor keep everything left aligned so then the eyes you know follow because we read from left to right it would be aligned with the text but it is okay if you wrap the text around it with that padding that's my understanding and that's how we've always done it okay thank you i was just wondering mm -hmm. thank you yeah no i'm glad glad I you asked that in a Word document, I think that it's not accessible to do it at a line, but in a web page, it's fine because if you strip out the HTML, it's going to be in the same exact location as where you have the photo right now, right? Which is probably right before the words, the theory of plate yes. tectonics, right? Yes, that's a yes. really good point. And, and that with Word, um, the accessibility checker in Word will flag images that are not in line with text. That's a really good point. And that may be where that advice came from. Um, but yeah. in these they think pages, it applies everywhere, yeah. but it, it, it doesn't because Word literally doesn't give it context around the text. The, yeah. In an HTML page, it does. Right, because that image is going to appear, right, glowing lava here. And so it's in order. Yeah, so that's not a problem. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you so much, Heather. Thank you all for attending this amazing webinar um, and giving the facilitator your attention. Once again, please look to the chat for the survey link to complete it. Um, the survey is set up to allow you to receive a copy of your responses, which you can use to serve as verification for your attendance. If you experience any issues, please reach out to support at cvc.edu and we'll put that email in the, oh, thank you, Sochi. Um, we hope that you register for other webinars that we'll be offering throughout the term. And we'll drop a link in the chat to showcase our upcoming programming. And lastly, this webinar and associated slides will be available on our At One um, website under events. But please allow a few days for us to appropriately caption the webinar before we're able to share it. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks, Thank you, you guys. Great webinar. Good. Mm -hmm.